Sponsored by the Carteret County Democratic Party, we thank you for joining us. My name is Susan Schurer. I'm a retired teacher from Pennsylvania living in Moorhead yeah. City, a volunteer with the Carteret Democrats, and most importantly, a grandmother of children in the school system in Moorhead City and in Havelock. I am truly honored to introduce our topic tonight and our guests. In this pandemic, we are living through a shared experience of great magnitude. Schooling Children surely ranks as one of the, its most challenging and unforgettable aspects. Will anyone with contact to a child in the last year ever forget the anxiety and perplexity of helping them, worrying about them? Or will we forget the patience, kindness, and heroism of parents and grandparents, friends, and teachers? I know I won't. Before I introduce our guests, all of whom have been on the front lines with children, a bit of technical housekeeping. Let me first recognize volunteers who have made the Dockside Chat a reality. Katie Tomberlin, the chair of the Carteret County Democratic Party, Maria Zempel, Amy Forhees, Lucy Bond, and Wendy Boss. Thank you. All guests will be muted during the presentations. If you would like to pose a question to our speakers, please write it into the chat box. Lucy Bond will collate and organize the questions for us. We are very fortunate to have our five guests this evening. Many, many thanks to Rob Jackson, the superintendent of schools for joining us. We know how busy you are. It is fair to say that Rob Jackson has more solid experience at every level of public school education than anyone I know. He has served as a school secretary, a bus driver, an after-school associate, teacher, assistant principal, elementary school principal, high school principal, a chief communications officer, and now a superintendent. All of that while working patiently for one degree after another to earn a PhD from Wingate University. His record of service to his schools is exemplary as evidenced by numerous commendations and awards, including the Dr. Sam Houston Leadership Award in 2019, given for the first time to a school superintendent. Very impressive. Welcome, Dr. Jackson. Michael McGinn has been teaching at Carteret County Schools for 15 years, specifically as the Latin teacher at West Carteret High School. He did his graduate work at the University of Toronto's Center for Medieval Studies and Pontifical Institute of Mon Medieval Studies, specializing in the Anglo-Latin tradition of the ninth, of ninth century England. He also has his master's degree in classical Latin from the University of Georgia, where he worked with Richard Lafleur, editor of Wheelock's Latin. Welcome, Michael McGinn. I have to say that my heart stopped when I saw Wheelock's Latin, but that's for another time. Katie Statler is a mom of three in the Carteret County Public Schools, ages six, eight, and 10. She was the PTO president at Newport Elementary School for three years, parent advisory council representative to the Board of Education for three years, and was elected in November 2020 to the Carteret County School Board for District 2. Congratulations, Katie, and welcome. Cheryl Williams Moraven was born and raised in Carteret County, attended Newport Elementary School and graduated from West Carteret High School. She received a Bachelor of Science degree from Greensboro College, National Board Certification in Special Needs, and a Master's of School Administration from East Carolina University. Ms. Moraven retired in July, 2018 after working 37 years in education. Woo, woo, that's a long time. <laughs> in special education for 15 years and as an assistant principal director in Carteret County Public Schools for seven years and in Craven County Public Schools for two years. 
She is also a member of Citizens for Diversity in Education. Welcome, Ms. Moraven. Missy Oden is a lifelong citizen of Carteret County employed in the field of industrial and systems engineering. When not working, she is inspired to community service by her deep faith and her family, which encompasses three generations of impassioned community service. Missy grew weary over the last 10 to 15 years, watching unfair treatment of underrepresented communities in our area and felt called to speak for them. Over the last few years, she has fully committed herself to groups like Concerned Citizens for Moorhead City and Citizens for Diversity in Education. Her goal is to ensure that well-rounded conversations lead to solid planning and solutions. Welcome, Missy Oden. We hope that this dockside chat will make a contribution to that goal. <clears throat> I would also like to recognize recognize Mr. Richard Paler, Assistant Superintendent for Strategic Improvement, who will be joining us on April 20th to discuss the status of the school bond. I thank him very much for being here tonight. Let me remind participants to add questions to the chat box and we will address them after hearing from our guests. And we're starting at the top with Rob Jackson. Dr. Jackson, what on earth was it like for you to learn that you would be in charge of an entire school system in a pandemic? Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me this evening. I'm extremely impressed and grateful for the number of folks who've, who've come together to talk about schools and education anytime, but particularly in the middle of a pandemic. And I wanna echo some of your early words um, sharing your appreciation for parents and grandparents, as well as teachers and educators and all that so many have done right now. I can tell you that yesterday was our one year anniversary of a huge meeting on a Sunday afternoon, the day after the governor had announced we would close schools for two weeks. At the time I was finishing my sixth year as a superintendent in Chowan County, and had not yet realized that I would have this incredible blessing to serve in Carteret County, and it is indeed a blessing. We didn't know a year ago that a year later we would still be in the midst of this pandemic. What I did know, though, was as I stood there with the team I was serving with at that moment, and I'm sure the team that was right here at that same moment, was that educators do what educators do. And I'm sure Ms. Moraven, after her many years of experience, would echo that teachers do what teachers need to do because of the love they have for children. And I'm so grateful for teachers like Mr. McGinn and our entire school system because they stepped up to the challenge. We had never considered delivering meals out into the community. And at the moment we were talking about how in the world are we going to deliver meals and someone brainstormed, well, what about using buses? Our knee-jerk reaction was, you can't do that because we have six-inch binders with rules for how to use buses, and we weren't allowed to use buses to deliver meals. Well, we got on the phone, and pretty quickly, DPI and the state board changed the rules so we could use buses in a brand new way. And truly, education's rules have been changed over the course of the last years. We're doing things we never thought we would have to do. But in all things, I'm just so grateful for the teachers and staff who every single day courageously step forward and say, I'll do what it takes because I love the children and I'm here for the right purposes. And so uh, the, the takeaway for me a year later is we are just so blessed in our country by the teachers and educators who do so much for our children. And certainly here in Carteret County, we're blessed by the parents and grandparents and community members who give such incredible support to our school system. Thank you so much. Could you outline for us what were perhaps the greatest challenges that you had to face? Absolutely. So um, as I mentioned, one of the early challenges was making sure that our children were fed. As we know, many children rely on the schools and school system for a lot of things. One of those is nutritious meals to be able to, to eat on a regular basis. There's community groups that put together our book bag programs to send um, food home to our children on the weekends. And if they're not in school, they're not receiving um, that food. 
Another challenge was making sure that we stayed in contact, particularly with families um, that may be in crisis as the children weren't gonna be there on a daily basis. So we didn't have the opportunity to be in contact with them. And certainly as this community knows, after going through hurricanes, after a crisis, just being able to communicate with the family and make sure that they're okay and reach out to try to serve their needs um, can be tough. For the, from the educational or academic standpoint, one of the biggest challenges was simply moving to teaching in a remote or virtual environment. Most of our teachers had not done that before. That was not a part of their undergraduate training. It was something we were moving towards. In Carteret County, uh, we were very blessed that because of the foresight of the staff and the Board of Education and the support of the Board of County Commissioners, we had devices for our students. It was pretty close to having for all of our students. We had to get devices for our primary students, our youngest students. But because of that, we could move a little quicker. Our teachers had some familiarity but we were literally um, building the plane as we flew it. And so uh, those are the biggest areas in terms of making sure we're feeding our children, staying in contact with our families, and then just changing the delivery of education. Uh, we've certainly had others as we've gone along, but we continue to face those challenges. And, and I've said we face unprecedented challenges with unbounded love, and truly that's where it comes from when you talk about teachers. How about surprises? Were there any surprises in this experience? Um, absolutely. Um, we, I, 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 tongue in cheek, one of the surprises is we learned how quickly uh, the state could move when they needed to. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> prior to the pandemic, trying to get a transportation uh, a manual change might have taken the months, if ever, and we, we managed to get that done in a couple of days. Uh, one of the surprises perhaps was just the um, resiliency of the system because we literally changed every single process. Early on, we tried to compare it to a hurricane, for example. A hurricane comes through, there's devastation, we're out of school and we begin to um, go back to school and begin to um, recover from that hurricane. But unlike a hurricane in this pandemic, we have literally changed everything. And so after a hurricane, when our children come back to school, they go to the bathroom the same way they've always gone to the bathroom. They walk down the hallways the same way. They get on the bus the same way. They come into the building the same way. They sit in the classroom the same way. They go to lunch the same way. Every single process in the school system, from how you get on to a bus to how do you go to the bathroom, how many people can sit in a classroom, all of that, radically changed and completely changed. And so had I been asked or had an educator been asked, could you absolutely throw apart everything you know, build it back and be back teaching children within a week? I would have said yes, because I'm an educator and educators are optimistic, but I don't know that I would have completely believed myself, but we saw that throughout, um, throughout our state and certainly in Carteret County. And so I don't know if that's a surprise so much as an affirmation of just how, how amazing teachers and principals and educators are, but it was certainly something that was a sight to behold. And, and we continue to see um, growth and change as we go forward. Thank you. I know that many parents and grandparents and neighbors and friends are worried about children falling behind. Um, in math, perhaps, or reading. Um, I'm actually a little bit worried about my grandson. Can you tell us what your thinking is um, to help students catch up, those who have fallen behind? Absolutely, and thank you for that powerful question. And so we do know that there has been learning loss across the year that we've been in this pandemic. What we do not know yet is how much learning loss. Part of that work is the work of teachers being face-to-face, elbow-to-elbow with students and really working with them because certainly while there's state assessments and there's testing and that gives us some information, there's no information as valid as a teacher working with a student and being able to say, here's where we're falling a little short, Johnny, let's work on this particular item so that you can grow and be prepared as we go forward. And so we've got that work ahead of us to really be able to assess the learning loss and then begin to work forward. 
one of the things that would never happen is that we were going to retain every child in the grade level they're currently in. We can't do that. Each of our children will move forward into the next grade level. And so our work will be to meet that child, say a current second grader in third grade, to understand where those deficits in learning might be, address those deficits, but we have to continue to move forward. And so uh, for the educators like yourself, Professor Schur, one of the things we'll be doing is working through our standards and really looking at what we're referring to as power standards. Those things I absolutely have to know because they're foundational to my learning. I've got to master this so I can go to that. And so the challenge will continue really for years for our teachers as we understand not only are our children dealing with the learning loss across the pandemic, they're dealing with the learning loss that may have occurred with the two hurricanes that occurred previous to that pandemic. Our children have certainly missed significant time over the last three years. And so the absolute need for incredible teachers, and I know a future Dockside chat will talk about our incredible teachers and the need for our great teachers, but that need is paramount because that is our work and that is our challenge going forward. Now, I believe in us and I know we're gonna do a great job with that and our students are gonna to continue to do a great job, but that's truly a challenge to understand the learning loss, be able to assess it with the teachers doing that assessment in a real and authentic way and mm -hmm. then addressing it through our power standards. Oh my goodness. God be with them <laughs> as they tackle that. It's a big job. I'm going to ask Michael McGinn to give us a teacher's perspective, but don't run away, Dr. Jackson. We'll come back to you. Um, Michael, how has this been for you from, a, from the classroom and perhaps your kitchen or <laughs> dining room? Um, what has teaching online and during the pandemic been like for you? Well, well um, Yes, everything that Dr. Jackson said about the surprises and the doubts, could, could we do it, could I do it, um, could the kids do it, at, at the almost the end of this school year, I'm amazed at how successful our kids have been, how resilient they are, and they've taken this real challenge, and I've seen more growth, quite honestly, I've seen more growth in our students this year on just a completely personal and, and global level, I've seen our kids be more successful than I've ever seen success in students before. And it's almost that, that old truism that, you know, the, um, the more challenges, the more you're given, the more you can do with it. And our students, I think, are, are proof of that. Um, Dr. Jackson mentioned um, some of the, you know, the teachers didn't have a lot of um, experience with teaching digitally. And I will say Carteret County has been so fortunate that we already had the one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative in place so that all of our students had a Chromebook. And on Friday, March 13th, we said to all of our kids, um, take your Chromebooks home. We may not be coming back anytime soon. And everybody did. So last year, we, we, we got the ball rolling. We tried to figure it out. But when we came back to school this year, I think all of us as teachers realized that we were gonna to have to think in ways that we had never thought before. So for those of you who know anything about Latin, for those of you who know anything about studying a foreign language, there's, there are some real challenges. Um, I think more people would learn other languages if it were just as easy as that, if you could just read a book and figure out how to do it. So I know for me in the classroom in previous years, I have lots of online um, exercises that my students do. I get them to record videos. Um, I record videos, they watch things. So we've done a lot of digital education, but this year was the first time that, that we've had to put in place an entire curriculum that was digital. And that is a, that's just, it is reinventing the wheel. So in addition to the 15 years here, I've taught for about, so I'm, I'm maybe in my 23rd year of teaching. And I'm gonna say this was the hardest year ever. Yeah. I know my content, but oh my gosh, how do I um, put that content? How do I deliver the content to my students in a meaningful and significant way that they can understand. And that I was the challenge and things that you can never count on. So I, 
even though I wrote the teacher's key for Wheelock's Latin when I was working for Dr. LaFour, I know Wheelock's Latin inside and out. But I choose to use Cambridge Latin series here at West Carter because it's just a great high school series. Um, Cambridge Latin series, I've got a student, Autumn Gillikin, who's online. She can attest to this. We've been able to access the Cambridge Latin series text free for years. Cambridge Latin series has always been really easy to deal with. Suddenly, as of September 7th, the Cambridge Latin series put a paywall up on their textbooks. So I had to scramble around and I had to go to our administrators and say, uh, if we can find $15 for every student so that I can buy a unique password um, uh, code for all the kids to access the textbook. So this was just one more way in which things were constantly changing. We are always having to sort of think, okay, now what, now what? Okay, what do we do? Fortunately, our administration has been great. Um, it's just, yes, it's been challenging, but I've really, yeah, I've just enjoyed rising to the challenge and I've enjoyed seeing our students do the same. That is so nice to hear, but I, I'm going to give you a tough question. I think Latin students are particularly well healed. Did your uh, colleagues in math and history and writing have the same experience? So everyone forgive me for revealing my biases. <laughs> <laughs> I always joke to the English teachers and the social studies teachers, you can just assign them the pages to read. It's all in English. All the kids have to do is remember the stuff. So, um, <laughs> I know that the expectations of my colleagues in especially history and English was that the kids could do the work. So they assigned the same amount of material as they usually would with the expectation that the students would do it. So the, I think the frustrations on, um, on the parts of my colleagues in especially English and social studies was getting the kids stimulated, motivated to do the work, and more importantly, trying to deliver it in a consistent fashion. Um, it, it, we have these learning management systems, the LMSs, and some teachers are using um, Google Classroom, some teachers are using Canvas, but some teachers um, give assignments every day and some teachers give a week's worth of assignments on Monday and expect it to be due either on Friday or Sunday. Well, the, the teachers that give the week's worth of assignments, typically kids, especially high school kids being high school kids, they're just gonna wait to the last minute to do it all. And sometimes they're late. Um, and so that was the challenges that I saw in the other disciplines. My colleagues in math, never ceased to amaze me with their dedication. Um, we had a real uh, question about whether the um, Wi-Fi infrastructure in the high schools could handle synchronous education. So could a teacher be standing in front of a small class, teaching that class, but film herself and be broadcasting that to students at home. And the advice early on was that we shouldn't, we couldn't rely on that, so we shouldn't do that synchronous learning. So all of my math colleagues, they just got together and they filmed themselves and they really just went out of their way to make sure that their kids were, were successful. So it's not a surprise to say that every department handled things differently, but I think now that we're almost at the end of, of the year, we've all kind of figured it out and we've we've gotten very good at it. Very good. The new challenge is Bravo. going to be, well, thank you on behalf of all my colleagues. The real challenge is going to be on Monday when, in a way, we have to start everything over because now we have to pivot back to an old model but we're all used to doing things in the new way. So as I've told all my kids, okay, there's gonna be a new seating chart, there's gonna be new kids because cohort B is gonna come in with cohort A. Um, it's gonna be almost like starting the year over. So we'll see how things happen after okay. Monday. Okay, well, we wish you the very best of luck and your colleagues Thank you. also. Let's hear from a parent. Um, Miss Katie Statler, you have three young children, and I am very curious to know, how did they handle online schooling? 
Um, they were all very different. I have a kindergartner who had never been to school. So for her, she didn't know anything different. Um, and then I have a second grader who really thrives on those in-person relationships and um, being a leader and setting an example. So she struggled some at home with um, the lack of being kind of be the chance to be a leader and show other kids what to do. She doesn't really do that at home. Um, and then I have a fourth grader who's on the autism spectrum and he loved the fact it took less time, um, but he took more time than his siblings, which I know so many parents struggled with that because the kindergartner was done quickly. Um, and he also needs some one-on-one -on -one services that you, we couldn't get during COVID. So that was a struggle in itself. Um, the, when we switched to the mix of cohorts A and B, he really struggled due to the lack of consistency. And I really struggled if I should do something different with him than I did with the others or push through. But thankfully, since they've been going full time, he's thriving now in school. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. That is wonderful. The $65,000 question, of course, is how did this experience change your life? I already appreciated our teachers, um, but it was next level when I was suddenly not even doing near what they're doing. They were still providing the curriculum and the basis of all the instruction, but just having to work with each one. I'm, I had to learn fourth grade math again, which is really sad, but true. Um, so <laughs> a deeper appreciation and realizing how much they really get outside of just education at school and how much of it is social, emotional, and just the support that they get mm -hmm. from those teachers and their friends and those um, that big support group that they really have at school. It's another family. At the end of the day, when your children had been doing online school, what was the signal that told you it had been a good day? If everyone finished without tears <laughs> um, and if they were still, some days they would keep going with some of their options. Some of, they were in elementary school. So some of their stuff was fun. And if they would keep going or I'm gonna do an extra dream box activity or whatever they were doing that day, or even just wanted to talk to a friend or Skype a friend, um, just knowing that they were still engaged and still excited. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, that's very good. And now they're going back to school. How do you feel about this? Did you want them to stay out of school longer? Are you on board with the children going back to school? As a parent, how do you feel about that? Mine are in elementary school. So mine have been back since October. Oh, I see, okay. But when deciding um, about the middle and high school kids, I spoke with pediatricians and teachers and principals because they're all the expert in their field and I have no medical experience or teaching and really went with what they recommended and they thought at this point um, it was safe enough and we've shown that we could do it safely that the kids really needed to be back if possible. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Moraven, based on your many, many years teaching and in administration and as a community member, I'm wondering what is your sense of how the students are doing? How are they faring in the community? Okay, uh, with this question, Missy Odin and I, we're both from the Citizens for Diversity in Education. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to team tag on this so that we weren't overwhelming everyone with the same answers all together. <laughs> That's fine, go right ahead. Okay, so Missy, if you want to address it first and then I'll team, tag team after you. Sorry, I couldn't get it unmuted. Um, good evening, first of all, to everyone. Um, first, I just give thanks to God for this opportunity and I thank him for each of you that are here. I thank God for our administrators our um, teaching faculty, our school board representatives. I thank God for everyone that is here. Um, and I just continue to pray that, um, to Ms. Sue's point, that um, we continue to, to keep these lessons learned at the forefront. So um, when we look, 
Um, sorry. So when we look at our community and going through these um, current circumstances, we, um, we tried to look at it from a statistical approach and try to really understand of what, what we're currently dealing with as far as um, from the diversity spectrum of things. Um, um, and since our Citizens for Diversity and Education initiated these conversations about five to six years ago, and in a district that is made up of roughly 77% white, 6% black, 9% Hispanic, 6% um, of two or more races, 1% of Asian, um, and 1% of Native Americans. Um, out of the 4.7 social workers, psychologists, counselors, and um, per 1,000 students, zero of them are African-American. When we first started these conversations, there were at least one. Similarly, zero is also the statistic for supporting roles in central office positions. Um, in the past, there were two for principals and assistant principals. There were five at separate times. So these facts coupled along with the pandemic itself adds additional gravity to um, the weight and need for both students and faculty to have someone within reach that can relate to them. Um, someone who understands them for who they are, someone who understands their struggles without words having to be spoken, someone who knows the weight of the black tax and the weight that it carries in our area. Um, like, um, in an area such as ours and in common spaces that we live, work, and play in um, for those who are unwilling to own the fact that there still is work to be done, especially regarding race relations, relations that in turn um, trickle down to our kids and then spread to other kids or is felt from teachers and guidance counselors or coaches, bus drivers, pimps, principals, assistants, um, even down to the parents, which in turn um, perpetuates the cycle of hate that we must come against. Those who call this guarded thing or Carteret County air heritage. Um, and really heritage is okay because here in Eastern North Carolina, it's a part of all of our heritage, but tolerance of unfair practices um, and acts um, that do exist is not okay. Fair opportunity at every level is what we must collectively push for to see to it that our entire school system, both communities that look like me and those who don't recover at similar rates. Okay, and so when you say how are students in your community doing under these new circumstances, while the pandemic most definitely affects everyone, it further complicates already existing gaps and deficits as well, as Dr. Jackson said, we know we've lost some time with our students through this year. The need for more tutoring opportunities, both in-school interventions and paid after-school programs, transportation concerns, because we know that some of the students aren't gonna have that transportation to do after school, so it's gotta be during school. The bandwidth limitations, the food insecurities, which was handled very well with our school system, with them being able to transport the food on the buses. And what about with our schools and community making great strides to meet this need at the time? But then it comes back to the things like the lack and the gap in data captured for minorities, especially in those cases where at the high school or even in some of the middle schools where there's less than 10 minority students in that class. So the data is not there because you have to have that ceiling. But those 10 minority students still matter. In times like these, we need statistics that will justify and show what that child is and isn't doing. A helpful question would be, are we measuring the gaps shown by the COVID test scores, practices and standards against pre-COVID baseline for each of these diverse sections? When we look at the composition for those that are identified as gifted and talented, 1% is black, 4% is Hispanic, 5% two or more races, 3% is Asian, 1% is Native American and 87% are white. Some say these numbers don't amount to much in an area that has a diversity rating of 0.4% as in Carter County or a county population of roughly 7% overall for the total African-American. But 
Were we to take a strategic pause, we could definitely see the correlation, especially if we were to overall and overlay real life experiences over the numbers. Were we then to overlay these known gaps in our school systems data points onto the statistical impacts caused by the pandemic, the fear is that our worst fears of further setbacks in minority communities are probably actually already being realized. And because of this, how many of our kids have slipped silently through the cracks and planned safeguards, pandemic checks and balances? How many teachers are afraid to admit that they are mentally drained by the fear of being shunned? I know Mr. McGinn said that at the high school, the teachers were doing very well. They had stepped up to the challenge and they had thrived on the challenge. But myself personally talking to some teachers, they have struggled and they continue to struggle, having to go from in-person face-to-face to that virtual digital, they were unprepared. With the lack of discipline and social engagement, how many young people have wandered off of this positive course with no one around to redirect them? To correct this, our school system, our communities, our resources, we each, regardless of our national narrative or local rejection of their mere existence, we have to come together and be intention, intentional about wanting to make positive changes in these areas. CDE, which is Citizens for Diversity and Education, believes that the greatest gains made were the largest deficits. We must continue to improve the gap between passing and college readiness in high schoolers. We must improve gaps in reading data for proficiency and college read readiness. Currently, there's at least one data point missing at every applicable school in the black category. If there are no metrics to capture this, no baseline or improvements can be measured. We must improve current disciplinary rates and rate of referrals to law enforcement. Despite similar accounts of bullying and harassment, Blacks are four times more likely to be turned in for the criminal acts and five times more likely to be referred to law. If we don't take corrective actions in these areas now, situations like the pandemic will continue to cause further detriment within our minority communities. So what we're doing now, we need to look at what's working and what's not working. We need to make some adjustments together. So it's not just one group lost and they have to survive on their own. We all need to do it together. Thank you so much. I asked for the voice of experience and boy, I got it. <laughs> Dr. Jackson, would you like to respond? Uh, thank you very much. Um, and first, let me say how much I really appreciate the opportunity to work with Citizens for Diversity and Education. Um, Missy Oden is an incredible speaker and, and has spoken to our Board of Education and just did extremely well. Our meetings, we've been meeting quarterly. In fact, we have another meeting coming up at the end of this month. Um, the group has been incredibly open and forthcoming in sharing concerns and really um, demonstrating a deep desire to work together with the school system to meet the needs in the school system. And, and that is just something I very much appreciate and am absolutely dedicated to the work of ensuring that our faculty, our administrators uh, throughout our school system, that we certainly reflect our community so that every little boy and every little girl can see someone held in great respect who looks just like them. And so we're, we're continuing that work going forward. And, and I appreciate um, I appreciate that work. You know, too often in our uh, greater community, folks will complain but not want to do anything about it. And that's the opposite of what I've seen with the Citizens uh, for Diversity and Education group. Um, they are absolutely wanting to do something about it in a very positive way. And that's just, uh, just been wonderful. And so I, I'm enjoying working with them um, and really setting goals about our faculty makeup and, and setting goals to meet the needs of every single student because, um, as Ms. Moraven mentioned, when we have fewer than 10 or 25, depending on the assessment, in a 
subgroup of students, they don't give the score for that because they have to protect the confidentiality of the individual student's score. When there's a large number, then you can protect that confidentiality. Uh, that doesn't mean though, that if it's 10 or fewer, nine, seven, whatever the number is, those scores don't matter or those students don't matter. They absolutely matter. When we say every child matters, we have to mean every child matters and we have to do that work and we have to look at the needs of our students. And so I, I appreciate um, being able to work with, with the group and, and certainly that work is ahead of us. And we want to make sure that there aren't groups that have been um, impacted uh, at a greater level that we're not working with and doing everything we can for, because when we say every single student, we have to, to mean that and we have to be willing to do that work. And we have to be willing to have tough conversations and, and to, to engage in those conversations in a very authentic way. And so, so I appreciate the group and, and I know we have a lot of work to do together, um, but I just appreciate anyone who says, hey, we've got a lot of work to do together let me help do that work. And so I, I, I do appreciate that. Thank you so much. I have documents here, um, brochures and printed materials from Citizens for Diversity in Education. And the materials are extremely impressive. They're beautifully written, they're scientific, they're really, really well organized. And um, I am particularly um, eager to see uh, the the um, the scientific approach to the students in the smaller groups and to you know have their test scores and and be able to compare them with the rest of the group it's really really good hard work that has been done and it sounds like even more work ahead of everyone <laughs> so that's wonderful. Um, I'm going to turn the floor over to my dear friend Lucy Bond, a former teacher in the school system, who is going to field questions for us. Okay, there we do have a really good question, and I know all over North Carolina they are asking this question. Um, what about, and I guess this is for Dr. Jackson, what about the, dis, the students who just disappeared and didn't access the online um, you know, programs in, in Carteret County. Um, so it was stated that there are 10,000 in North Carolina who just kind of disappeared. And so how many in Carteret County have disappeared? And I'd be curious to know too, like, do we know, did they go to private schools? Did they um, are just doing homeschooling? I know I've, I've seen a few posts on Facebook where parents just decided to enroll in another um, program outside of the public school. So I, it would be interesting to know, um, you know what, what you know about that, Dr. Jackson. Ms. Bond, thank you so much for the question. As always, thank you for all your service in, in the school system and, and, and that life of service. We certainly have faced that as one of the biggest issues. And, and I mentioned early on that that was one of the biggest issues in our school system one of the benefits of bringing our students back as quickly as we could, and, and that's a credit to our teachers and administrators for ensuring that we're following the safety protocols and could do so safely. But one of those benefits was that we were able to recapture our students to ensure that if they weren't showing up, we could use our counselors and social workers to reach out. And so in this moment, we don't know of a student who's just disappeared. We've been able to track our students and know that they've gone to a homeschool or a private school or a charter school. And interestingly, we actually saw as our elementary school students came back an influx of students coming into our school system of parents who wanted their children in school and, and quite a few from um, the charter school as well. And so we certainly appreciated that the piece that we've struggled with, and Mr. McGinn may be able to speak to this um, from his experience at the high school level, is the students or parents who are, I don't wanna say taking advantage, but are taking advantage of the opportunity to request to go virtual almost on a daily or weekly basis. And so, uh, you know, Ms. Bond, as a, as a teacher that sometimes teenagers don't wanna engage in schoolwork. And so being able to say, I'm gonna be virtual today, or I'm gonna be virtual this week and head off on a vacation, that sort of thing, 
has become a bit problematic. And so really that, that work with trying to encourage our students to be in school, or if they're going to be virtual, to be engaged in being virtual is ongoing work. And so to the large numbers, what we've seen across the state is that the larger majority of those numbers, as you would imagine, are in the more urban areas where um, in some cases there's school systems who haven't been in school face-to-face -face in over a year. And, and I can't imagine that work with those children who have not been face-to-face -face in over a year. Um, in our school system, because we came back at least on a hybrid model on the first day of school, and then of course our elementary school students came back five days a week in October, we've really been able to come side by side with our children and, um, and been able, thanks to the work of our counselors and social workers to track our children down. Um, the work continues, of course, um, especially when um, children may be taking advantage of other educational opportunities that may not be as rigorous as our public school system um, when they return to us to help again fill in those gaps as well. And so if I might, Ms. Bond, the group may enjoy hearing from Mr. McGinn and, and his experiences with that. And he can say, uh, Rob, you're right on, or Rob, you're missing the boat. So uh, we'll, we'll see what Mr. McGinn has to say. <laughs> well, Dr. Jo uh, Dr. Jackson, uh, you, ha you probably have a, a, a more global perspective on all the schools and all the students. Um, certainly last spring when we went into quarantine, some students did just sort of fall um, off the radar. I don't know that they disappeared, but everything was so uncertain. And I think there was just a lot of anxiety. And I think there were anxieties um, at home with families. So I, I noticed that there were people, students that I didn't hear from regularly last spring. But once we began this school year, after the first couple weeks and some irregularities of attendance, for those of you who don't know, we send to each of our students every day an attendance form. And we ask them questions like, you know, how are you doing? Is everything, you know, everything going well? Um, are you getting the work? Are you understanding it? Do you have any questions? And they submit that every single day. And if they don't submit it, um, I, I email my students. We get in touch with them one way or another. Really, I, for, for my students and for most, um, most of my colleagues, by about the middle, by about end of September or October of this school year, we were hearing from most of our students on a regular basis. And I have found, and this is again, maybe I'm a bit of a Pollyanna, but I found that my kids, if they were in cohort A and coming on Mondays and Tuesdays, when they were at home on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, they were working. <laughs> they were they were babysitting for somebody. They you know were working jobs. They were making the best of it. I mean, I have been so impressed. You know, the the belief that that teenagers are lying around, sleeping or gaming all day. I didn't find that to be true at all. So again, I was impressed by by their industry. At the high school, we've done a really good job of kids who are 100% virtual, if they are not performing, then Dr. Jackson is absolutely right. Counselors get in touch with them. We get them into school. And at the high school, we have this afternoon fifth period um, that runs from 1 to 2.30 in the afternoons. And we get those, we make those kids come to school. If you want to graduate, then you have to come during that, that fifth period and you do credit recovery. And that's been really su successful. I've had one senior who he switched to virtual for second semester and I was worried about him because he was eh, not one to want to get to school at eight o'clock in first semester. So I thought this may not be good for him, but he didn't do anything in January, but you know, we called him, he started coming in during that fifth period and he's called everything up. So yeah, maybe we, there are students who are slipping, but I think our schools or at least the high school where I teach, we're doing a really good job of catching them before they disappear, pulling them back in, giving them the face-to-face, -face, we care, we're here, come on, you can do this, we can get you through this, and, and they do, they manage to do it. Dr. Jackson is right about the school systems that have not been face-to-face -face in a year. That's, that's where the real um, tragedy and that's where the real, I'm, I'm afraid to use the word damage, but I think that's where you're going to see a lot of 
of work that will have to happen when those kids come back to school. But in Carteret County, we've been, we're great. <laughs> yeah, it, no, I have a, my daughter-in-law teaches science middle school in Durham County. They live in Raleigh. And I babysit because she's home working virtually and they are just going to school um, right after spring break to for the first time face-to-face. -face. Yeah, it's a totally different thing. But I do know some students in this county who have gone to other schools or programs. So I, I just want us to recapture them back in the public school because it's, I just believe in the public school system so much. Um, so another question um, posed on the chat box would be um, wanting to do something about diversity is different from doing something. So what are, what are we going to do um, to recruit our teachers um, to help those students who need a you know, uh, uh, someone who looks like them. And really, you know, a diverse teaching staff speaks to all students. It's good for everyone. Um, Dr. Jackson, do you want to answer that one? Or uh, you want me to come back to you? <laughs> no, thank you. That's great. And, and thank you for the question. And what you just said is extremely important. So I want to make sure I highlight that. You just said a diverse teaching staff is important and good for everyone. And so that's that's a powerful takeaway that having a diverse teaching staff is not only good for uh, children who, who may be in smaller numbers than, than other population groups, it's good for all of us. And so it's certainly something that's very important. I met with um, just about all of our minority teachers. Um, we had a couple who couldn't be with us and ask questions about, tell me what drew you to the school system uh, what barriers have your colleagues in, encountered? What recommendations would you have? What great ideas do you have about really attracting and recruiting as diverse an applicant pool as we possibly can because we do want to have a diverse faculty? One of the things that I noticed right off was in the group, with the exception of two, all of the teachers were quote unquote homegrown. They grew up in Carteret County and are teaching in Carteret County. And so one of the quick strategies we seized upon is this need to grow our own and to really encourage all of our children, but particularly those, those children of color who may want to teach because there's a, a great opportunity there. And so um, you kind of put me on the spot and stealing my thunder. So, so Missy acts surprised at the end of the month when we meet. Uh, great, that's the perfect face, just like that. Um, we actually have a seminar coming up. Uh, we've been working with the University of North Carolina at Wilmington and the University of North Carolina at Pembroke, and that's going to happen the first week of June for high school students who may be interested in teaching, and it's specifically geared for um, students of color, and so it's really trying to bring together a cohort because sometimes if you're the only person in class who looks like you, you may not be as motivated in that class. I can speak certainly not the same experience at all. I was an elementary teacher. And so in my classes, I was the only male in college in elementary education classes. Not, I'm in no way saying that's the same thing. I'm just saying when you're the only person who looks like you in a class, that can be intimidating. And so bringing together these cohorts of high school students who would say, hey, I wanna be a teacher and then helping with scholarship dollars and helping with access and being able to come back to community groups who say, I wanna support this effort and saying, hey, I need $200 to buy books for Johnny. He wants to be a teacher. And somebody says, I'll give you $200 if Johnny wants to be a teacher. Um, that works really important. And so that grow your own piece is extremely important and, and may be um, the lever that really moves us the furthest. We also, um, I have worked, continued to work with our HBCUs, which is our historically black colleges and universities. And I've been doing that over the course of, of the last 10 years, had the opportunity to be a part of uh, North Carolina Central's Chancellor insta installation and, and was in, very excited to be an invited guest there and be a part of that ceremony to develop that relationship. What we're finding in our HBCUs um, is that many of the students have a job opportunity, a contract in hand, making a whole lot more money out of state. And so one of the deans told us that 
they had students who are graduating who had never been on an airplane, graduating, getting on an airplane and flying to another state where they were going to make a whole lot more money than they'd make in North Carolina uh, because we are recognizing across the country in education that we need a diverse teaching force. And we really, the work is encouraging young people to go into education. And so, so that work I'm excited about. And, and, and again, um, Ms. Odin and Ms. Moraven act surprised at the end of the month when I show you the flyer that we have for students that first week of June. And so we're gonna keep doing that work and we're gonna keep looking for opportunities to diversify our faculty um, while always ensuring we have the most qualified faculty we possibly can because every child deserves that. Right, because the, yeah. Thank those you so much. Um, that, so um, someone did add, well, um, Mr. McGinn mentioned that there were 40 teachers from West Carter who participated in the diversity training last week, a diversity workshop. Um, and he said it was the best experience he's had in the last 15 years. Oh, um, wonderful. Yeah. Lucy, so, I think we're going to um, let our participants out of class a little bit early. Everyone okay. has been very well behaved. I want to thank everyone heartily and sincerely for the work you have done on behalf of our children over the last year and for joining us tonight. It's a great moment. I know we still have plenty of questions to go. So I, I'm happy to share with you that we have two more Dockside Chats coming up on the schools over the next month. On March 30th, we will talk about keeping great teachers and staff, rich, rich, field for creativity there. And on April 20th, we will have an update on the school bond spending. I hope that we will be able to talk about the life cycle of a bond um, and how that all unfolds. Thank you so much for being here. Very, very grateful to all of you. Thank you. I will see you at the next Dockside Chat and good night. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGinn. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Thank you. Thank you all for inviting us. It was our pleasure. We look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night. Good night.